Hello. Thank you for joining me for this, our fifth session of Savior, What the Bible Says About the Cross, a study by Magri R. De Vega. Today we will explore the cleansing atonement theory, which is based on the idea that sin is a stain on our lives that we cannot get out on our own. For each of us, there comes a time when we come to the realization that we have sin in our lives and we need to do something about it. Certainly none of us are exempt from the temptations of sin. So today we'll explore how Jesus came to redeem and to purify our hearts. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for walking with us today as we confront the sin in our lives and discover how Jesus' cleansing work on the cross draws us closer and closer into a relationship with you. Open our eyes to the places that we are vulnerable and allow us to lean into the ways you desire to purify us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Around 1846, Ignaz Semmelweis began working at one of two obstetrical clinics in Vienna. He soon discovered that mothers who delivered children at the first clinic had a substantially higher mortality rate due to childhood fever than those who had delivered at the second clinic. The difference was so stark and so well recognized that the expected mothers would beg to not be admitted to the first clinic, even at times choosing to give birth in the street rather than in that clinic. Semmelweis began studying his own daily routines and the routines of his fellow doctors, trying to understand the difference between the two clinics. Why would the first clinic have a higher rate of infection and resulting death than the second clinic? The only major difference he could find was that the first clinic trained doctors while the second clinic trained midwives. Eventually, he realized that the medical students at the first clinic, who also performed autopsies, were transmitting material from corpses to the mothers in the delivery room. The midwives in training at the second clinic, who did not work with corpses, were not contaminating their patients in this way. Semmelweis proposed that doctors should wash their hands with a chlorine solution. When they did this, as you might imagine, the rate of childhood fever fell dramatically at the first clinic, quickly matching the rate at the second clinic. Dr. Semmelweis connected childbed fever with the failure of doctors to perform the simple but critical act of washing their hands. From that point on, he not only washed his own hands, he insisted that other people wash theirs for the sake of protecting themselves and others. And it made a huge difference. But despite his insistence that other doctors do something as simple as hand washing, many would not believe him. Even so, he continued to insist on the importance of hand washing as a simple yet effective way to save lives. This story is a compelling metaphor for an understanding of the death of Jesus, sometimes called expiation, which is a fancy word for cleansing. It is based on the idea that sin is a stain from which we need God to cleanse us. The Bible contains numerous passages depicting sin in this way as a filthy, dirty blemish that must be removed with the proper cleaning agents. One of those scriptures is Psalm 51, which contains David's powerful confession after his sins of adultery and murder were brought to light. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Create a clean heart for me, God, David says, verses 7 through 10 of Psalm 51. The shock of David's actions is not just that it involved adultery and murder. That's horrible, but not all that surprising. 
other people committed those same sins in the Bible. The shock is that this was King David who committed them. He is hands down the most highly regarded king in the whole Old Testament. His predecessor Saul never had an affair that we know of, despite getting it wrong in plenty of his own ways. His successor Solomon never committed a murder so heinous, even though he messed up plenty as well. But the great King David, the one who is glorified above them all, committed some of the most harmful and violent sins in the whole Bible. The biblical writers could have chosen not to include this story, but that they kept not only the story, but described God's response to it via Nathan the prophet, is the Bible's way of saying that none of us, not even the most pious appearing among us, is impervious to the stain of sin. In a resource I was consulting recently, the author described four conditions in which we find ourselves most susceptible to temptation. They can be remembered with the acronym HALT, H-A-L-T. We are most likely to sin when we are hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. But interestingly enough, in the tragic story of David, a fifth word should be added to this acronym, successful, as in halts. For it is when David was successful that he was most tempted to sin. At the start of 2 Samuel 11, David and the Israelites had recently won a, won a victory against the armies of the Arameans and the Ammonites. And we get a sense that David had reached a point where there was just no challenge anymore for him in conquering other people. When springtime rolled around, he didn't even bother leading the army into battle. He was so confident in their victory that he stayed home to rest on his laurels and enjoy the spoils of his victory, while his general, Joab, led the army instead. The biblical principle here is that just because things might be going well in your life, it does not mean that you can let your guard down in your daily battle against sin. In fact, you may be the kind of person that is most vulnerable when you are feeling most confident. And that was David's problem. David had become so used to conquering and controlling that when he saw Bathsheba, he saw her as another acquisition. And then, he saw her husband as another obstacle in his way, another problem to be eliminated. Sin blinds us into thinking that we can handle power and control. Remember what the serpent told Adam and Eve. Eat the fruit and you will be like God. That's the temptation. In the very next chapter, the prophet Nathan comes to David with the powerful pronouncement and indictment by way of a parable. Nathan describes for David a rich man with many flocks who took and slaughtered a poor man's beloved lamb to feed a guest rather than killing one of his own. David pronounces harsh judgment against such a cruel act to which Nathan responds, you are that man, David. David had the whole kingdom at his disposal, yet he took the wife of another man, one of his own loyal soldiers. Confronted with this reality, David acknowledges his sin. And so we have Psalm 51, David's confession. In a way, we are kind of left to wonder if we would even have Psalm 51 in our Bible if Nathan hadn't shown up. Would David have confessed his sins if they had never been brought to light? We might wonder that about David, but we do not have to wonder that about ourselves. This Psalm 51 invites us to a preemptive confessional, to confess the stain of our sins even before our sins come to light. Psalm 51 contains a template for such a confession based on the cleansing work of God. It goes like this. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. That's verses 2, 7, and 10 of Psalm 51. Whenever we see the word heart in the Bible, we should remember that the ancient Israelites understood the heart as the seat of intelligence and emotion, the core of one's being. David then did not just ask for a change in his feelings, but he asked for a complete reboot of his values, his perspective, and his behavior. David said, God, you desire truth in the inward being. Teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Verse 6. When David confessed his sins, God graciously forgave him and helped him to make things right. And so it is with Jesus, whose work on the cross is the hyssop that not only cleanses us of our sins, but it creates a brand new heart within us and orients us within a whole new life. This cleansing work of Jesus is based on a New Testament understanding that Christ is the fulfillment of the Hebrew sacrificial system and the scape the scapegoat that took upon himself the sins of the people. You may remember that several of the laws in the Old Testament concerned the physical act of cleansing, calling for the Israelites to scrub up, wash up, and clean up. Consider Leviticus 16, which describes the ritual for the Day of Atonement or the Day of Reconciliation. It is, in many ways, a cleansing ritual. Instead of soapy water and hand sanitizer, there is the blood of a bull and a goat. And instead of a wash basin, basin or a bathroom sink, there is an incense pan. Yet the goal is the cleansing of sin that has accumulated throughout the year. The high priest Aaron is the key figure in the story, and he follows the precise formula given by God to go through the cleansing of the people's sins. The ritual must be performed once a year in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And it was designed to purge all the sins from the sanctuary, even those the people had committed unintentionally. Much of this terminology may seem odd and the image might feel a little antiquated, but there is one important dimension to this story. And it occurs just six chapters prior in Leviticus chapter 10. Here we also find the high priest Aaron under a very different set of circumstances. It turns out that Aaron had four sons, and two of them had done something to break the commandments of God. The details of their offense are not fully given, as the whole episode is described in only two verses in Leviticus chapter 10. But what is clear is that because of their transgressions, God was not pleased and these two sons of Aaron died. We then get a full sense of what is really happening in Leviticus 16. Once we get past the bizarre imagery and the peculiar business of taking burning coals on an incense pan and sprinkling incense into, in to perfume the offering, and once we get past the slaughtering of the goat and the sprinkling of its blood, and if we remember that this is a ritual of cleansing that comes as a gift from God, then we come to see what is really happening here. That is, we see a man overcome with grief, not just performing ritualistic cleansing for the guilt of a nation, but trying to cleanse his own guilt and the guilt of his past. And it is here that humanity discovers that some stains are just too hard to scrub away with soap and water. The deeper stains of guilt and shame require something stronger, something far beyond our ability to cleanse on our own. Each and every one of us probably have stains that we cannot get out of our lives. Like Aaron, there are haunting regrets that have filled our past. 
And these regrets are easily identified by the way they each begin with the same two words, if only. If only I had been more disciplined, I would not have given in to that temptation. If only I had handled that situation differently, I would not have made such a dumb mistake. If only I were a better parent or a better spouse or a better communicator. If only I had a different past or had a different environment growing up or knew then what I know now about myself. If only, if only, if only. As we have come to discover along the way of this theological study, there are a lot of ways to define sin. Some of them are based upon what we have done. Some are based upon what we haven't done. Some are based solely on the condition into which we, are, we were born and the ways that culture and environment have conditioned us to live. And then there is a way to look at sin that covers them all. That sin is a stain that we cannot get out on our own. A stain of guilt, a stain of shame, a stain of sin. And so it is that the old high priest Aaron went into the Holy of Holies to make a burnt offering to the Lord and cast the sins of the people on the sacrificial animal. The Day of Atonement ritual called for two goats, one to be killed and sacrificed on the altar, and the other to receive the sins of the people and be cast out into the wilderness. That was called the scapegoat, the one on whom the guilt the sins of the people were placed. That was the thing that became dirty so that the people of God could become clean. By the time the New Testament writers began reflecting on what the cross of Jesus meant, this idea of the scapegoat became an influential part of their understanding. They identified Jesus as the new scapegoat, the agent of cleansing, the one who would become dirty with our sins so that we might be cleansed of all of our sins and our shame and our guilt. Listen to how the author of Hebrews describes Jesus as the new Aaron, our new high priest, and the scapegoat that makes us clean from our sins. But Christ has appeared as the high priest of the good things that have happened. He passed through the greater and more perfect meeting tent, which isn't made by human hands, that is, it's not part of this world, he entered the Holy of Holies once for all by his own blood, not by the blood of goats or calves, securing our deliverance for all time. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkled ashes of cows made spiritually contaminated people holy and clean, how much more will the blood of Jesus wash our consciences clean from dead works in order to serve the living God? He offered himself to God through the eternal spirit as a sacrifice without any law. Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. Other passages include Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, which goes like this. He saved us because of his mercy, not because of righteous things we had done. He did it through the washing of new birth and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. And in the first epistle of John, we hear this. But if we live in the light in the same way as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. 1 John 1, 7. The understanding of the cross based on cleansing has been influential throughout history in some of our greatest thinkers and hymn writers. Tertullian described sin as a state of being unclean. Every soul then, by reason of its birth, has its nature in Adam until it is born again in Christ. Moreover, it is unclean all the while that it remains without this regeneration. And because unclean, it is actively sinful. In his work on perfection, Gregory of Nyssa wrote, Christ being an expiation by his blood, teaches each one thinking of this to become himself a propitiation sanctifying his soul 
by the mortification of his members. This is something that Flannery O'Connor came to recognize in her own life. She's widely considered to be one of the great Southern spiritual writers of the 20th century. And in her published private journal, she acknowledged the way that the sin within her served as a kind of foreign body that eclipsed the glory of God in her life. She wrote, Dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. The crescent is very beautiful and perhaps that is all one like I am should or could see. But what I'm afraid of, dear God, is that my self shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me to push myself aside. Oh God, please make my mind clear. And then she ends with these words, please make it clean. This cleansing idea of atonement would become the basis of a stanza from the great hymn, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look for thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Now, there might be some of us who are troubled by this understanding of Jesus' death on the cross. For again, every approach has its pros and cons, just like we've looked at for the last four weeks. And we do not have to agree on every single atonement theory. There are those who are troubled by the image of a God who demands the taking of a life for the saving of humanity. So for some, this whole scapegoat imagery of Jesus is a tough jump to make in the context of modern times. But here is something that we can all agree on. We all know what it's like to have stains in our lives that we cannot remove. We are haunted by memories of our past, just like Aaron was haunted by the skeletons in his own family's closet like a wine stain on a carpet or a paint stain on clothing. The guilt and shame from our past just lingers on our souls and it is impossible to scrub it away even as hard as we try. Gripping addictions, bad choices, private secrets, failed shortcuts and quick fixes. Try as we do to clean up our lives, maybe we just get so tired of scrubbing and try as we might, there's always residue that remains. Discontent with life, anxiety about the future, strains in your relationships, painful memories, haunting guilt. But the good news of all of this is that the Bible says that we do not need to clean our own lives. We need only to depend on what God has to offer us through Jesus Christ. Because on the cross and through the empty tomb, God's very own heart has been poured out for all creation to cleanse and to purify even our nastiest of sins. All of us are in need of that which washes us and makes us whiter than snow. This concept of atonement claims that through the cross, as we confess our sins, we receive the all-purpose, all-powerful, stain-fighting work of Jesus Christ. And we can be made clean. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Murphy's Law. Some of you may even swear that you are currently living by Murphy's Law. Some of you might even have written a book on Murphy's Law. Put simply, Murphy's Law says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. But you might not be as familiar with another such law. This one is called Embassy's Law of the Conservation of Filth. It says, in order for something to become clean, something else must become dirty. If you think about it, it's true. Whether you're taking a shower, scrubbing dishes, washing the car, you'll notice that dirt doesn't just poof, disappear. 
It has to go somewhere. For dishes, body parts, automobiles to get clean, dishwater, washcloths, and sponges need to get dirty. And Bessie's law is a practical law, but it's also a biblical and a theological law too. In order for sin to go away, sin has to go somewhere. For us to become clean, to have our sin removed, something or someone has to become dirty. From the Bible's perspective, that thing that became dirty so that we might be clean is the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one true effective way to fully remove the blood of sin from a person's life, and it is through the spotless, perfect blood of Jesus Christ. It is that blood that took our sin to cleanse us and to free us. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, that's John 1, verses 8 through 9. 1 John 1. My apologies. So all we have to do is confess our sins and allow Jesus to cleanse us of those things. And what this means, of course, is that we do not have to clean ourselves. And that's a good thing. Because the more we try to clean up ourselves, to cleanse ourselves from our own sins, the more we are likely to make things even worse. Sometimes we think about David and how he just kept getting worse and worse and getting himself in more and more trouble in regard to his sin with Bathsheba and then his attempts to cover up that sin. A little bit after Embessy's Law came out, someone named Freeman added an extension. So now in Bessie's Law, with Freeman's extension, reads like this. I'll go slowly because this is a little bit complicated. In order for something to become clean, something else must become dirty. But you can get everything dirty without getting anything clean. In other words, it's a whole lot easier to spread dirt around than it is to clean dirt up. And it's a whole lot easier for human beings in an effort to rid ourselves of our own sins to infect other people with those sins. There is only one way to fully be cleansed of sin, and that is through Jesus Christ and the salvation he offers. So this last way to think about cleansing, especially in the context of the gospel accounts of Jesus' death, the Gospels paint a contrasting view of two people and two bowls of water and two different ways to wash. If you remember, Pontius Pilate, who followed his sentencing of Jesus to death by washing his hands. Perhaps Pilate had grown weary of the debate and the competing voices between his own conscience and the Jerusalem crowds. Perhaps he had sensed Jesus' innocence, but cowered in fear of the growing mob. Perhaps we would want to give Pilate some credit for at least considering the correct choice during his deliberations. But when Pilate washed his hands, he absolved himself of any opportunity to do what was costly, what was risky, and what was right. In contrast to this, whereas the pilots of this world will choose what is easy and expedient, Followers of Jesus are called to live a cruciform life, a life of service and self-surrender. In contrast to the way of violence and appeasement, disciples of Christ are called to peace, self-sacrifice, and love. And of course, the greatest model of all of this was Jesus Christ. Think now of the foot washing bowl of Jesus. On the night before he died, just hours before Pilate washed his own hands of the situation, Jesus assumed the role of a servant 
and washed the disciples' feet. And then he gave them a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 34 and 35. So think about this question. Are you a foot washer or are you a hand washer? Will you offer yourself in self-giving love to others? Or will you choose the less complicated way of self-centeredness? Will you follow a road that is marked by cowardice or a road that leads to the cross? Will you choose a love for power or a path of powerless love? All of us without exception contain the filthy contaminants of a sinful life. God has been at work in us, performing a kind of autopsy on our souls, identifying that within us which is eclipsing the glory of God and preventing us from fully loving God and others. So what does your autopsy report say today? Lingering bad habits, unhealthy choices, private secrets, shortcuts, quick fixes, greed, avarice, boastful pride, Whatever your diagnosis is, your symptoms are clear. Discontent in life. Anxiety about the future. Strains in your relationships. Painful memories. Haunting guilt. And the words from Dr. Simon Weiss in that opening story I shared ring in our ears. For God's sake, just wash your hands. Let's remember that we cannot clean up our own life. Instead, we need only to depend on what God has to offer us through Jesus Christ. Because on the cross and through the empty tomb, God's very own heart has been poured out for all creation to cleanse and to purify even the nastiest of saints. The cross cleanses, purifies, and washes us of our sins. And if we confess our sins, we receive the all-purpose, all-powerful, stain-fighting work of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, may we live each day knowing that we are clean and pure in your sight. We praise you for the grace and the mercy you have shown us. And we thank you for your cleansing love that renews us day after day after day. In Jesus' name.